what we're going to do tonight is we're going to obviously be looking at some portions of the Dead Sea Scrolls, and we're going to be looking at some of the things that they have found there. And I must say, some of them are quite amazing. But before we do that, let's just recap a little bit. Let's go back a wee bit. Now, if any of you are a student of history, you'll know that in the past 200 years or so, the Bible has been on a systematic attack made on it on many fronts, both on its authenticity and the accuracy of its, of its pages. And it's, it's such a problem that many people actually doubt the existence of God himself. You know, the socialistic upheavals of the French Revolution that spread through Europe around 1790 through to the early 1800s, with its spirit of liberty, fraternity and equality, it began a, it began a new age of thinkers, people who mocked the scriptures. And this was followed by groups that were known as the schools of high critics that critiqued that questioned and criticised the Holy Scriptures. And of course, in the mid-1800s, there was Charles Darwin's theory of evolution, which gave an alternative option of belief. And this accelerated a decline in religious belief. And you take the 20th century, two huge world wars and an increasingly affluent society all helped to erode that belief. But it's really interesting, you know, that almost as those things were happening, all the time, little gems would pop out of the ground, as it were. Many discoveries made by archaeologists and even historians, they found things directly related to the Bible, and almost without exception, they confirm the Bible as a very accurate historical record of mankind. They, if you like, serve to prove the Bible true. Unfortunately, despite this, many of our world today are either sceptical or simply don't believe the important lessons and the message that the Bible holds for all mankind. Tonight's consideration concerns probably the greatest archaeological discovery of the 20th century. Literally thousands of complete or part Documents were found that confirm the accuracy of, as, as Keith said, the, especially the Old Testament, how accurate it, was, it has been uh, recorded throughout the centuries. Now before we consider this, we're going to look at a timeline of discoveries that give food for thought to sceptics and non-believers and in fact strengthen those who, who believe in the, the Bible as, a, as an accurate record of God's dealings with mankind. So we're going to look at a chronological display, if you like, of some of the things starting at Genesis going through to the time of the Lord Jesus Christ and the Apostles. What of the Bible itself, though? Before we start that, we know that the Bible has had over 40 different authors. Moses, Peter, Amos, Joshua, the list goes on. People who who recorded the words of God. They represented from all walks of life. The Lord Jesus Christ was a carpenter. Peter was a fisherman. Moses was a, if you like, a political leader. Many others as well. They lived in countries all round the Middle East. <coughs> Egypt, Syria, Israel. Lebanon, parts of Europe. It was written over a 1500 time span, from the time of Moses in BC 1400 approximately, through to the time of the Apostles, around AD 100. A 1500, yes, written in three languages, Aramaic, a very small portion, but basically it was written in the Hebrew and the Greek. Somebody, and not me, has faithfully gone through the scriptures and found that there are 2,930 characters mentioned in 1,551 places. 
You'll have to check that for yourself to prove that. Of course, we have a vast array of subjects that were covered. History, poetry, law, prophecy. The list goes on. Expressed in all these different forms, in different ways. And written in different circumstances, in time of peace, in time of war, in time of enslavement. Of course, prior to the Dead Sea Scrolls, but taking, taking them out of the picture, there has always been records, what we call Old Testament manuscripts. These are some of the, uh, the ones that, have, that are still in current, that, have been, that people still have um, copies of. But it must be remembered that these are copies upon copies upon, upon copies. And only small portions of the Holy Scriptures ha had been found. And we're relying on what is called the, the Masoretic Text we see there in AD 100. That was, that was used for the basis of the Old Testament. Others that we know of later, complete copies of, of the Old Testament were found, and the most notable of those is one known as the Aleppo Codex. And interestingly, that, 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 that codex was a full manuscript of the entire Old Testament, written round, as it says there, in AD 130. And Jewish communities for years had used this, this text to ensure that the, the Old Testament especially was kept uh, complete. Unfortunately, in 1947, during the riots that took place in Syria, where this was stored, and there are currently riots there at the moment, this copy that was stored there was damaged when the uh, nation of Israel was declared. Fortunately, some... Jews had hidden most of it, and it was smuggled into um, in Israel in 1958. When it was complete, it had 487 pages, but by the time it reached Israel, some 150 were missing. Nevertheless, the, 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 the copies that had been made at that time, and they had been compared with the Masoretic text, proved once again how accurate the, cop the Bible had been faithfully copied. But it must be admitted, they were copies sometime written after the originals. So that's the Bible that we have today. And as we later on, as we consider the, um, the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls, we'll be able to see um, how accurate they were. Now, there's... The, the ancient tablets we have there of the Sumerian kings, for instance, and we read there of their story of the flood. And the one, the particular um, uh, copy there of, was called the, the Gilgamesh Epic, which basically copied the old, uh, the, the, the record of the flood, which we have in our Bible today. Some names have changed and other things. But you know what's really interesting about this whole thing? A German scholar by the name of Richard Andre has collected 88 different flood traditions. 20 from Asia, 5 from Europe, 7 out of Africa, 10 from Australia, and 46 from the Americas, starting from the North America through to South America. All ancient um, civilizations had their own record of the flood, and many of the Things that happened in the Noah flood that we read of in our Bible are copied, if not word for word, but certainly the very, very similar thing. So we can have confidence that the ancient historians of all these civilizations believed in a flood. The tables, the tablets of Ebla. You know, what's really interesting about these is that there are literally thousands of stone tablets that have been found, again, in this place in Syria 
just a few miles north of the land of Israel. Of course, Syria was known, that area moving up through there and Iraq was known as the cradle of civilization. These tablets were found, as we read there, in 1964. Do you know what's really interesting about them? As we see there, they have, they have made valuable contributions to Bible, biblical criticism, including references to Sodom and Gomorrah. They also record for us an account in Genesis 14 of the five cities of the plain. In Genesis 14, there was a story of Abraham and how he fought with the kings in that time. All those cities are mentioned. And it's interesting that many of the biblical names that we read in the scriptures, Abraham is mentioned. We're not saying, for instance, that that was the Abraham of the, of the Bible, but certainly that name was well known at that time. So far, 8,000 tablets have been uh, uh, absolutely translated out of the 17,000 that have been found. And as we can see there, the, um, they come in hand form and some of them are considerably larger. You know what the tragedy of the Ebla tablets is? The real tragedy? The Syrian government, when it realised that so much information was coming out of those, that confirmed not only the biblical record, but the rights of the nation of Israel in the land, they sacked most of the archaeologists and replaced them with those who had a different view. And they sought to suppress much of the information and discredit any of the tablets which seemed to support biblical history in regard to Israel. Politics had got in the way. Another interesting, um, in this time a, a papyrus was found a, 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 in paper, early paper, and as we can read there, this papyrus dates from the end of the Middle Kingdom. In other words, it was the, it was the pharaoh that, ex, that took over the throne after what was known as Ramesses II. And this is the period in which it's the, 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 we read in the scripture of the actual time of the plagues, the ten, famous ten plagues that took place in Egypt with Moses. Now, this Egyptian has written an incredible account which almost matches that of the record of the plagues. It's called The Admonitions of an Egyptian from a Hieratic Papyrus in Leiden, which was a, a university in Europe. And I'll give you an example of some of the closeness of it. If, for instance, in this Ipaware Papyrus, it says in one particular part there, it refers to the river of blood. And of course, in Exodus 7 verse 21, it says there was blood throughout the land of Egypt. Later on in, in a, um, another part, which is a reference 6.3, it says, Forsooth, grain has perished on every side. And of course, in Exodus, it talks about the, the crops being destroyed. It talks about animals moaning and dying. And of course, in the Exodus record, it talks about the cattle which is in thy field, there shall be very grievous sickness. So right through all the plagues, there is a reference in this papyrus to the same things. So was this a first-hand account? Many believe so. Again, we can't say, for instance, for sure that that was, but it does. the time period does fit. An inscription was found in 1976 of a stone tablet that had been broken up, as it were, and uh, this whole wall in this building was made up of bits of stone tablets. And the inscription we find there records a prophecy by a person called Balaam, the son of Beor, recording a prophecy very similar to what we found in Numbers 22. Uh, and to 24. And the interesting thing is, although we can't prove that it was the same Balaam, isn't it interesting that the dating of that corresponds with and the story refers to a man named of Balaam and very similar to what we read in the scripture concerning that man. 
the sorcerer who prophesied against Israel. Now this is very interesting because it's the only mention, it's actually the first mention of Israel and the only mention of Israel in Egyptian records. And it says at the bottom there that it, one line reads, mentions Israel, says Israel is laid waste and its seed is not. And a, um, a, a, a doctoral candidate from the University of Arizona has spent many years reviewing the various interpretations and he comes to the conclusion that it was the nation of Israel and at the time, as it was, as the um, this particular chap called the Mernetatha Stella, again, he, his reign was around the time that Israel was uh, during a time of judges. And Israel, at the time of judges, were an agricultural society. And there's a number of records we know from that time of the, from the Book of Ruth and from Judges that there were there were famines in the land and the seed was waste. Again, the timing is interesting because that, that stella was written around 1300 BC which would indicate that Israel had been in the land for uh, between 50 and 100 years which fits the time of the judges. Again, found in a in a place in the known as it's, it's a archaeological site called Tal Dan refers to the house of David, an unusual term. And it would indicate the, that the particular inscription was written at a time when the King Hazel of Damascus had taken this area and had made comments that he'd killed the kings of Israel and Judah in battle. The Bible records that it was Jehu that performed that. But he names both Jor uh, the kings of Judah and, of, uh, and Israel, and he also indicates that the house of David was sitting on the throne of Israel. Again, proof that David was a king in Israel and that his family ruled for some centuries after his death. Now this is very interesting. It's called Barak's Seal. And in the 96, 1996 issue of Biblical, uh, Biblical Archaeology Review, it featured an article of a seal belonged to Barak, the son of Neriah. The same name as the scribe that we read of in Jeremiah 36, who recorded all the words that Jeremiah spoke. What's really interesting is there's a fingerprint on that seal, a clearly found fingerprint. We can't say that that was the same barrack, but the dating of that by the archaeologists put it at that same time. So at the time that Jeremiah 36 was written, there was a barrack, the son of Neriah, was there too? Was there a scribe, two scribes in the land of Israel? Unlikely. It's quite possible, even probable, that this man was Jeremiah's scribe. Tabor's Prism, one of the most famous accounts written by King Sennacherib of his exploits. Each side of this tablet describes different campaigns that he fought. And what's really interesting is that he refers to the battle against Hezekiah around 701 BC. And you note there he says that he had caged, he had Hezekiah caged like a bird shut up in Jerusalem, his royal city. Now we have, of course, the same record in the second of Kings chapter 18 and Isaiah 36. What's really interesting is that right through his campaign, he mentions all the cities that he conquered, including a city called Laish, 
and he took away all those people. But he never records that he actually captured Jerusalem. And the biblical record talks of a night when 186,000 of his men died. Is that coincidence? Well, according to a a well-known historian called George Rawlinson, he wrote that, interestingly, no one has ever determined why Sennacherib did not enter in Jerusalem with his great army once it was besieged, because reading of his other campaigns on the prison, he was doing so with great urgency. The fact is, he departs, and there was an abrupt discontinuance of Assyria's western invasions. In other words, Syria had four armies, northern, eastern, western, and southern. I think. If, we are, if this is correct, the biblical account is correct, his whole western army was destroyed near the gates of um, Jerusalem. And it's also recorded that he never, ever went back to, down to the, to, around to the area of Israel. And later on, we're told in Isaiah 36 that his own sons murdered him. His history has proved that to be the case. Again, does this, what does this prove? It just proves to us that archaeology has absolutely confirmed the Bible's record. about New Testament times? Quite an interesting story here. I've actually, I've actually personally got the newspaper that was written in the press in 1993, I think it was, or 1990, of this particular occasion. What actually happened was a dump truck, believe it or not, was backing into an area and it fell through the roof of, an old, of a t- what they found to be a tomb. And they discovered this, what's called an ossuary, and written on the sides of it was the name Yosef Bar Kufa, the S- Joseph the son of Caiaphas. Contained in this particular little casket, as it were, were the remains of six people. And the tradition was that the person was laid in a crypt, and when they had rotted away su- sufficiently, they pulled the bones apart and stuck them in one of these boxes. Interestingly, it was a tradition that only took place over a period of about two generations, and it fits very much in the time of Christ. Is it Caiaphas, the high priest, that persecuted the Lord Jesus Christ? It all fits. This is the first time, if it's true, that we have the physical remains of an individual named in Scripture. You see, Caiaphas was the high priest for 18 years, from AD 18 18 to to AD 36. And it's most likely he gained that position by marrying the daughter of Annas, the head of what was the high priest clan. For a number of years, a whole generation, all the high priests were chosen from this family of Annas, a very powerful man. Pontius Pilate. Pontius Pilate is is well known and named in various places. But physical evidence to prove that he was there at that time was found with this inscription, along with some coins. Pontius Pilate, of course, is renowned in the scriptures, and this particular um, inscription has been dated to that time. There's no doubt that Pontius Pilate the Roman governor, if you like, existed and was there at the time of Christ. Just moving through the New Testament a little bit more, this is the oldest fragment of any copy of the New Testament found in Egypt in 1920. It has been identified as part of John's Gospel. Apparently there's writing on both sides and the, 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 the basically the, uh, the writing talks about 
in, uh, from John chapter 18. And it talks about thy word is truth. And the, the answer is from Pilate asking, well, what is truth? Well, the truth is that this has been dated to around AD 125 to 150. The last of the New Testament was written around between AD 90 and 100. This particular fragment is within that generation. But just confirming how accurate scriptures are. Now, I'm not going to go through these, but these are just other archaeological discoveries that have been made that have proved other aspects of scripture. The Hittites, Emperor uh, Pharaoh Shishank, the revolt of Moab. There was, no plan, there was no king named Sargon. Instantly, they found out that Sargon was the king that destroyed the t temple of Ebla, where all those particular um, t tablets were found. Uh, we, we've mentioned Sennacherib's siege of Jerusalem, but he also destroyed the city of Lachish. The assassination was, was actually recorded by his other son, Urshaddon, who took over. The fall of Nineveh, the fall of Jerusalem. Interestingly enough, it, it was claimed that Belshazzar, the king of Babylon, who was named in Daniel chapter 5, didn't exist until tablets were found that he was actually the son of Nabonidus and was serving as co-regent. That is why he could say in the scripture that Daniel was made third in the kingdom behind Nabonidus and behind Belshazzar. So all these things here are um, just designed to confirm once again how accurate biblical history is. Now, the Dead Sea Scrolls. They have, uh, are, if you like, the final proof of the Old Testament record. Dr. Brian Wood, who's um, very high up on what's known as the, the Associates of Biblical Research, he was asked, what was the greatest archaeological discovery ever? And this is his words. Probably the Dead Sea Scrolls have had the greatest biblical impact because they've provided an Old Testament manuscripts approximately a thousand years older than our previous, previous oldest manuscript. The Dead Sea scroll, Scrolls have de uh, demonstrated the Old Testament was accurately transmitted through this interval. In addition, they provide a wealth of information on the times leading up to and during the life of Christ. Let's look at a bit of a history of it. This is a a picture of the young chap who found them, Muhammad Ad Dib. He was looking for some stock that was disappearing up the cliffs. And while he was there, he noticed these holes in the wall. So he threw a stone in and he heard pottery smash. He grabbed his two cousins and they were going to explore the cave, but it was getting late. So they headed home and the next morning they headed out. And he was the first one actually in the cave. And he recovered what is known as the seven... Um, discoveries in cave number one, including, as we'll see, some amazing things. The Isaiah scroll, the Habakkuk commentary, the, 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 the rules of community living, and he took them back to show his family. Interestingly, when he took them back, he tried to sell them, nobody was interested, so he hung them from the tent for a number of days or even weeks before finally taking him off to another place to sell them to this dealer. And it's been estimated that many of these early discoveries were partly ruined by being removed from the caves and not being um, kept in a similar environment. Nevertheless, some amazing things have been found. The area? Well, we see there the Dead Sea. Dead, the Dead sea. The area is very close to Jerusalem, some 14 miles. But the journey is very rough. A number of uh, steep hills and, and gullies and so forth. The area is quite isolated. And you can see there the number of caves. And uh, in total 11 have been found to contain uh, archaeological discoveries. A very remote area. 
as we're going to look in a few moments, it's, Qumran is located around nine miles from uh, south, south of Jericho and approximately one mile west of the northern shore of the Dead Sea. This site dates from the Maccabean Revolt, about what, BC 167, right through to the time when uh, Rome came and basically destroyed the city and also a number of other sites. In fact, for many, many years, the reason why it wasn't explored because some of the remains of that city were regarded as Roman and they thought it had been a Roman outpost built, built there, not realising the value of it. And it wasn't until the Dead Sea Scrolls were found that they began to realise that this, this, out, this dusty outpost may hold some archaeological value. This is taken from one of the caves looking out towards the Dead Sea and it shows you just how remote and how um, difficult this area is. Very, very isolated and very, very um, difficult terrain. This is a display of how some of the scrolls were found in the caves and they were put inside these jars, and many of the jars were sealed tight, with like, like wax or pitch, probably taken from the area of the Dead Sea, which where pitch was found everywhere. Hence they were preserved. And of course the area is it's very dry and warm, and many of the parchments were, because of that, were still easily pulled apart and read. There's a few of the caves, and we can see there were over 900 manuscripts written in Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. And for nine years after 1947, the caves were scoured, and of course, as I read there, 11 were known to hold Dead Sea Scrolls. And notice that in all 11 of these caves at Qumran, every book from the Old Testament is represented, except the Book of Esther. Every book of the Old Testament. Obviously, not all of them are complete portions, but many of them have been compared with modern uh, Masoretic texts and found to be identical. There are variations, that's absolutely true, but the, 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 the people that analyse these are looking at the absolute nth degree, a missing dot or a missing something slightly different. But the overall, is the, most of the texts that have been found are very accurate compared to the ones we have today. Cave 4 is the most famous because it contained more than 15,000 fragments from over 200 books and 122 biblical scrolls were found in this cave. Some of which can't be opened because of their fragility. Probably the greatest actual discovery in terms of a, a, a one particular item was called the Great Scroll of, Scroll of Isaiah. It was one of the original ones discovered. And it's one of the best preserved. Interestingly, they have, done, they have compared absolutely every letter. And there's been, in, on this text, there were some variations and some words missing and some words added. But the context and the way that the... the um, the book of Isaiah is presented and the meanings are virtually identical. Hence its value. It's dating from 125 BC. Almost a thousand years older than the, than the oldest complete manuscripts that, that we have like the Aleppo Codex and the Leningratus Codex which were written around 900 and 1000. The problem we have with the, the Hebrew uh, scrolls and stuff is that inevitably as the scroll wore out it was, it, was, it was remade or reprinted and the rules for a person who was copying the text were very, very strict and, when, and then the old one was destroyed. And that's the reason why there are not hundreds of Old Testament scrolls of the various books. The Jewish tradition is once a new one had been made and the head of the Masorites had inspected it and determined that it was correct, the old one was destroyed. And do you know how they worked out if it was correct? They had certain rules, of course, and, and comparison made, but they also added up the text. 
because the because the, the Hebrew the Hebrew text has a, has a numbering value, and so some of the scribes would number each page, and if it didn't add up to exactly what the previous one did, it was torn up and redone. So that's how we know that these were very accurate. And at Qumran, they found a whole area dedicated to writing out the text of the holy of the scriptures. That's all they did. They sat at these desks, and these desks were laid out, and that's what they did. The scribes at that place. This is a copy, an exact copy. You can buy these, by the way, if you want to buy a copy of the Dead Sea Scrolls, sixty thousand dollars each. It takes four months to make them. And they are copied, the paper is copied, the writing is copied, the stitching is identical. It is an exact replica of the original. So who were these scribes? Who were they? Well, after these six, six seasons of intensive Excavation, the, the scholars were sure beyond any reasonable doubt that the scrolls found the origin in this community. The scrolls had been stored in haste in the caves as the community fled from the encroaching Roman army, which was in Judea to put down the Jewish revolt between the years AD 66 and AD 70. The group was likely the Essenes, previously known from references to them, the writers of Flavus. Flavius Josephus, Filio Judeus, and Philene the Elder. There are differences of opinion on whether they were this Essenes group, but most of the scholars today believe that they were. Now this is interesting. The contents of the Dead Sea Scrolls indicate that their authors were a group of priests and laymen pursuing a communal life of strict dedication to God. Their leader was called the righteous teacher and they viewed themselves as the only true elect of Israel. They were alone faithful to the law. They believed that the priesthood that was at, at currently at that time in Jerusalem was not the right priesthood. They were appointed and the true priesthood which went through the line of Zadok was deposed around the time of the, of the Maccabean River in AD 167 when the Maccabeans fought their various wars against the Seleucids or Ptolemies, I think it was, I can't remember now. So when that priesthood was overthrown, this group did not accept the priesthood. In fact, they call them the corrupt ones. They called them the wicked priests. Now, according to the scholars, the chief categories are represented are the Dead Sea Scrolls are the biblical. As we've seen, all the books of the Bible, or parts of it, have been found except the book of Esther. Then there's the apocryphal. These are works that have, that have been omitted from most of the what I call is the accepted canon of Scripture. And many they have contained many books that um, certainly sh shed an interesting light on some of the books that have not been included in our current Bible. And sectarian. And these are the scrolls that related to the way of life, how they lived, laws, ordinance, biblical commentaries, visions, and other written works. So, what are the, some of the doctrines that they taught and believed? Well, it was the manual of discipline or community rule. These are the requirements you had to have to be a member of this sect or brotherhood. There was the thanksgiving hymns and, and songs. But there was the rule of war which dealt with the battle between the sons of light, which were the men of Qumran, and the, and the sons of darkness. The writer who commented this thought it was the Romans. But notice the last part, yet to take place in the last days. The men of Qumran believed the last days were coming. They believed in the day and the doctrine of last things. They fled to the desert, reading themselves for the imminent judgment. They believed it was coming when the enemies be vanquished. And they, as God's elect, would be given a final victory in accordance with the prediction of the prophets. 
it was a connection with these end time events that one of the most fascinating teachings of the sect emerges, called the Mess Messianic Hope. And apparently many writings have been written on, in, that they've found in some of these writings on this particular belief. They believed in three messiahs. They believed that the prophet, they believed that there would be um, a priest, and they believed that there would be a, a king or a prince. Now, what does the scripture say in that reading we did? That all scripture is given by inspiration of God as profitable doctrine, reproof, correction, and instruction, righteousness. This group at, at Qumran has faithfully transcribed the writings of the Old Testament over a hundred years for the, for the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. And they have shown us that their writings, when we take the, our modern writings today, translated from original Hebrew, are very much accurate and can be trusted. Now, what can we say about the evidence of archaeology? Well, we can be confident that the places and the people mentioned in the Bible are accurate, even though they, they took these people and places existed thousands of years in the past. We can be confident that the details of the biblical accounts have not changed over the centuries since it was written, as we have, if you like, fixed facts or times in which they were written, we can confirm and confidence that everything that God spoke through his written word will be fulfilled in its own time. And Isaiah 46 verse 8 said, Remember this. And show so what is the Bible's basic message? The basic message is that the Bible concerns God's dealings or his contact with mankind. And in that book, there's, there's this is plan of salvation that was to be outworked through the Messiah. The Messiah that the men of Qumran were waiting for. The Lord Jesus Christ. So the Bible has shown that time and time again by historians and archaeologists to be accurate from the beginning to the end despite numerous attempts to discredit it. As we've seen, as I've just mentioned, it was to be outworked through Israel's Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. And it will require the long prophesied return of Jesus Christ to establish God's kingdom on earth. You see, the men at Qumran were waiting for that event to happen. But it was not that time. This is the hope that the Old Testament prophets and faithful Israelites of that time hoped for. It was the hope of the apostles it was the hope of faithful believers throughout the centuries. It is, it is the hope of believers today. So what does it require? It requires a desire on behalf of individuals to seek these things out, to gain the treasure of a place in the kingdom of God which the Bible talks about. If archaeology, like the Dead Sea Scrolls, has proved the Bible correct in terms of history, does it not stand to reason that all other aspects it will be true as well? And the, 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 the great message of the, of the scriptures is the prophecies concerning the things to come. And we're living in that age. If you read some of the writings of in the New Testament especially, that speak of these things. We are living in that age of the return of Christ. And that's the question. What is everybody's hope? That, of course, is the subject of other talks. And, uh, God willing, we'll be able to consider those things 
over the next few weeks. Thank you.